Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 62 of Interstellar Quest, and we return to the mission of Rusty and Ed Lou Kerman, who have been in the process of diverting the asteroid B612 to make sure it doesn't hit Kerbin. Now, of course, they've altered its trajectory sufficiently. Uh, the mission is a success. Now they move on to the capture phase. Uh, Rusty has been on EVA affixing some important equipment to the side of the uh, a side of the asteroid, but he also has brought with himself a uh, little folding seat, just as one might on vacation set up a seat on the beach and enjoy the view watching the ships go by. Rusty has decided that he wants to uh, sit down and enjoy the view rather than say, sitting in the back of the spacecraft, only able to see this rock right in front of him. A little bit of EVA, finding a little nice little spot so he can look out, cast his eyes over the, well, the vistas that await him. There we go, stick that down there, and of course, time to board the seat and see where he is. Come on, look at that, oh, nice little view in there, look at the lights. Look at the spacecraft with all those antennas pointing straight back at him. Wah, ooh, ah, ooh. That's what Rusty's saying. Look, <laughs> ah, he's really enjoying this. He quite likes sitting out there. Anyway, after Rusty paused for a moment and sat his feet up, uh, he jumps back into the spacecraft so we can actually go about figuring out how to capture this thing onto a curb in orbit. Now, Easy mode will be an ecliptic or an elliptic or, but sorry, um, where we more or less burn at periaps, and that will bring us into a captured orbit, and hopefully, not one that will get disturbed by the moon. Because if it could, if it can uh, cross the moon's orbit, then it could get kicked into an orbit, which would bring it back to Kerbin again, and that would be unfortunate. Now everything is looking fine and ship shape. Let's figure out our orbit. Looks like. The Sentinel has been discovering some other new objects. Now note the two ellipses. One is from the original, well, is from the satellite we left behind, which is on the original orbit. And the blue one is, of course, me. And uh, for some reason, I'm trying to create a maneuver node here, and it is not wanting to create a maneuver node. Look at how close we are to an escape or a non-escape. Uh, we must be arriving r really slowly. 110 meters per second we're moving. Come on, give me that sweet, sweet maneuver node. I need to make this thing change. I've changed this asteroid once. Now I will change it into a part of the Kerbin's family. We shall look up into the sky and gaze upon its rocky, serene... Ah, there we go. go got it. Okay, so bring it to Periaps. And there, we can actually apply a little bit of acceleration. That gives me a nice little blue uh, velocity vector, which doesn't want to stay in one place. That is great. Um, yeah, it seems that this orbit is incredibly sensitive to my current orbit. So if I try to turn, that adjusts the orbit that I'm on, which means that the blue velocity vector is just all over the place. Well, never mind. Set that alarm, and uh, we'll uh, continue on our descent towards the planet Kerbin. That first burn is going to be three days away, and no doubt there's going to be fascinating things I can do in the meantime. Anyway, the asteroid diverter probe, uh, it's probably going to hit first, largely because its uh, it was on the same orbit, but we changed ours significantly. So the interesting thing about this probe, other than its inability to actually attach to the asteroid with its claw, um, the interesting thing about this is we left it on exactly the same orbit, more or less, as the original asteroid. So it should more or less land in exactly the same place. If we just time accelerate so we can appreciate the motions of the planets and having the, I have to say, having the distant object enhancements on really works marvelously because it means we can see both Minmus and the Moon and all the other planets laid out. We are coming in from below the ecliptic and then we're going to kind of... Actually, we, no, we might be coming in... 
yeah, we are. We're coming in from below the ecliptic. And I'm not sure where we're going to hit, but we're also going to arrive retrograde and at a very steep angle. I do not think that this thing will last very long. I think this will almost certainly burn up. But here we go. And you know what? I think I can see that ring of mountains and our thing in the middle. We are coming down pretty near the, the super large crater. You see that there? The mountains in the middle and the ring of, of hills around it. And this thing is not long for the world. RCS is fighting to keep it stable, and it is now oh exploding, and it is, dies. Not even, probably about twenty kilometers up. Well, yes, we would have made a second crater in the big crater, but now back to Rusty and Edlu, who are finally approaching Periaps, and we need to get ourselves into our actual capture position or capture attitude. I guess is the correct way. I've uh, nuked the maneuver node again because in turning around to actually get to this uh, orientation, the maneuver node just went off and decided it was in completely the wrong direction. So I killed it. I put it out of its misery. Okay, we're about six minutes away from Apple, uh, Perry App, sorry. We have 2.2 oh, gigawatts of power and we are starting to push this thing out. Ever so slowly. Unfortunately, we can't really tell the... We, we can't see the difference in our velocity since we're pretty much just falling towards Kerbin and therefore our velocity is increasing. But immediately you can see the Apple App's height is plummeting and the Perry App's height is actually rising right now. That's uh, not too much of a problem as long as we're trying to decrease the eccentricity. The eccentricity is up at 0.92 right now. Now the biggest problem with putting something like this into orbit is that we are essentially flying backwards at extremely high speeds and we don't actually have any mirrors. So Rusty has volunteered to get out and fly over to the asteroid and sit in his little uh, armchair there so that we can actually see where we're going in reverse, you know. So Rusty's going to call out and make sure that uh, Ed Lu doesn't accidentally reverse into the planet. Because, you know, that would be a bad thing, especially when you're carrying you know, 80 tons of asteroid with you. Yeah, I think, God, he's got a perfect view from there. Look at that. I bet you he's really happy that I applied those uh, better atmospheres patch and the, the cloud changes and everything. It looks, oh, it looks rather pretty. Look, we can see the, the rivers down there, which we should really take a, an aircraft down at some point or send a, send a, oh, we should build one of our flying boats and send it down there. Look at that. Anyway, this scene is so darn beautiful. Let's just sit here and appreciate this. Like Rusty, sitting, watching the planet Kerbin zip by and watching the giant flare of plasma ejected from the little prince. Ah, looks like two gigawatts of power was too good to last. We're now stuck at 1.19 gigawatts, but... At least Edlu can finally see the planet Kerbin. Oh, and there, you see that planet that's about to be eclipsed by it? Not sure what that one that is, but uh, yep, we can't see it anymore. Oh, that you see how the moon and the planet actually were eclipsed at different times? You know, this is a really important thing in astronomy. where It's called an occultation, where you basically have a distant star or a distant body eclipsed by a better known object, such as the moon. And uh, you can actually find out really, really good uh, details, you know, really high precision astrometry from uh, the time at which the edge of the moon cuts off a, a star. Oh, look, there's Rusty there going, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Yeah, never mind. He is really apparently odd. Oh, the power supply seems to be dropping off even more. 1.0 oh, gigawatts, 900. Oh, come on, adjust, adjust this. Oh, and I think we eclipsed something. So now we're down to 93 megawatts, entirely supplied by the solar power stations. Anyway, while the little prince goes around for another loop around the planet, we have the EVE Explorer visiting or rendezvousing with the EVE Sat ever so carefully, moving in at a couple of meters per second. I kind of want to parallel park these things as best as is possible here. 
If you remember, we need to rendezvous with the EVESAT because it has the magnetometers on it. We accidentally left the magnetometers off the EVE Express. And if we want the sweet, sweet scientific data they provide, we are going to actually have to send a Kerman over our Kerman, a Kerman or a Kerbal over to, uh, you know, examine the hardware, make sure it's properly calibrated and bring it back to the boys in the lab, more or less, for you know, proper processing to check out, to see what information we have. We're still in an eccentric orbit, note, that uh, we are on a an orbit which is an, a periapse of 7.5 kilometers and an apoapse of 38 kilometers. This is pretty close to some of these mountains. I think we could practically reach out and touch. There we go, just sitting there ever so carefully next to us. And... Just want to kill off all our velocity. We don't want to be going too far from each other. Thankfully, the tidal forces around Gilly are not particularly big. Since the gravity gradient is not particularly steep. Because the gravity itself isn't that steep, right? It's uh, Tidal forces are all about the rate of change of gravity, right? So... If you have a small compact object, it will have much higher gravitational forces than a larger, or a you know a larger object, let's say, that has uh, more mass. Black holes, of course, being the perfect example of an object with super high tides. Tides so powerful that your feet get more uh, significantly more gravitational acceleration than your head, and therefore you get ripped apart. Well, I guess for this rendezvous, Durdos Kerman flew it all from inside the lander can. Now, you can see the spacecraft there with that keythane probe there that hasn't actually provided any useful data here. Just using the RCS a little to try and adjust the position. I want to kind of bring it in close as possible so that we will uh, have, you know, the least distance to travel. 27 meters out here, and I think I'm actually going f away from it. Should probably fix that. I just kind of want to adjust these things. I kind of like the view from inside this lander can. The only thing is it's very hard to land because you can't see every, all the instruments you need at once. Okay, Durdos, it's your job to head across the gap. Head across this gap in deep space, but watch out for the super powerful tides from Gilly. Actually, they're not super powerful at all, are you? I'm just joshing with you. But with a head your size... I can imagine you would be particularly concerned about it getting pulled away from your feet. I tell you, the force of gravity on that head must be crazy. Okay, there we go. Now, I've had to patch these things again. Every time I upgrade the interstellar mod, I actually have to go back in and patch the dual technique magnetometer to make sure that I can actually pull data, pull the experimental data from the object. Uh, you basically have to go in and you have to add a few new fields to make sure that Kerbals can grab the data from there. And we, uh, yeah, we do have some other experiments on here. I'm not sure if I actually have any data in them, but I should probably grab it nevertheless. And, uh, yeah, also, B9 sensor package, we need to muck around with that to make the data available. And apparently there's no data available. Either that or the, the data is not rem removable. Anyway, uh, since those readings are from outside Gilly's sphere of influence, we can actually do... Uh, yeah, if we can move the servo control. I love the way the servo control just, like, appears right in the middle there. Apparently, Gilly doesn't have much in the way of a magnetic field. Who would have thought that? I mean, I myself thought it would have a magnificent magnetic field with giant Val Van Allen belts sucking in all those protons and antiprotons and making them fly around in their little dance as they oscillate from north to south. Now, the one magnetometer reading I don't have is from close to Gilly. And close to Gilly, uh, 8 kilometers is not close to Gilly. Now, I think I need to get down below 6 kilometers, according to the wiki. So I'm more or less going to, you know, accelerate towards the planet... And hopefully I can get close enough to do the readings, but not close enough that I end up being part of the mountain. Uh, although at this velocity, uh, I'll probably have plenty of warning before I actually hit anything. 
I'm only getting like 59 megawatts of power, so the acceleration is pretty slow. I've only changed the the speed of this thing by a few meters per second, but regardless, we're going to fly down toward it, and this takes forever. There we see, it's a good thing that you can watch this all in time acceleration mode. Now those beeps you're hearing there, those are from the Keithane probe. We've not actually been mining Keithane largely because I realised that the uh, resources in Interstellar were far more interesting. Uh, the Keithane seems... The Keithane's fun for a lot of people, I totally see it, but I'm uh, just not using it in this game. But Although I do like the look of the sensors and I like the map that it made, makes. Okay, down... So, oh yes, underneath six kilometers. Now we are really close enough to the planet to touch it. Can we log? Oh, there we go. Analyze magnetosphere and while near Gilly, it certainly didn't capture a magnetic field. Yes, but I captured an image of the magnetic field in my magnetometer and we'll keep a copy of that around. Okay, I tell you, it's really nice having this beamed power. Then we, we don't have to worry about the power supply on the lander or whatever running out of power while transmitting data home. These things are providing megawatts of power, millions more than what we actually need. We're only a few kilometers away from the thing. Note, incidentally, that because we went downwards, we are accelerating forwards in the orbit. This is a an important thing to realize that if you go down then you're going to collect more, you're going to pick up more speed, right? So, because you've exchanged potential energy, and what happens to it? It becomes kinetic energy. So, even if you make one burn quickly downwards, initially you will start to go ahead of the object. Of course, doing a quick burn straight downwards really just changes the eccentricity, so you'll eventually go higher than your target and uh, slow down. But, nevertheless... It, it, this is enough for us to make a quick fly down and fly back and we'll hopefully send the crew out to collect this data, but that's uh, that's not something you necessarily need to see. Oh, look at that. We're getting a whole 164 megawatts of power now. Marvelous. And finally, after 72 days in space, the crew of the EVE Explorer are going to land somewhere. Well, at least Durdos is, although given the Delta V requirements, I think everyone can land. But Durdos is the one that's taking the little spacecraft. Little spacecraft, which uh, at this moment is unnamed and probably needs some good naming suggestions. This will descend to the surface of this mysterious moon, somewhat slowly. But it will do so using only the power of RCS and monopropellant. Yes, there it is. Just two little uh, motor propellant thrusters, and I need to be very careful because it only has one solar panel, because apparently I forgot to turn on symmetry, and I only have one solar panel on this vehicle. The whole vehicle actually only masses about two tons, which means on the surface of the ghillie, it will weigh about 10 kilograms, because a ghillie has about 1 200th of a G gravitational acceleration. Uh, for those people that speak Fahrenheit, that's about 22 pounds. And for curious readers of the register, uh, that will work out to be approximately uh, two jobs or exerting a force equivalent to one Norris. Of course, the Norris being a unit of force that is named after Chuck Norris. Anyway, looks like we've got ourselves a nice little uh, descent trajectory there. We've only changed our velocity by such a tiny amount, but uh, velocities are absolutely minuscule here. And uh, yeah, we've used one unit of monopropellant. Oh my goodness, will we have enough to make ourselves get all the way down to the surface and return. Time to let the time acceleration kick in, at least while I can, because uh, the time acceleration stops being available at about 8 kilometers up. There we are, starting to move down, and uh, Durdos Kerman is not actually looking at the surface. I'm not sure why, but apparently uh, he just likes it that way. He's just trying to back up into the surface. He's trying to imagine doing the whole thing in reverse. Uh, there, it looks like we might actually be coming down onto that giant mountain there. 
Great! Means we don't have to go as far down. I hope we can get down below six kilometers though. Okay, so we're pretty much getting our attitude set up for landing and we're running out of time here. So we'll see the landing in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.